I'm Smriti and I'm an architect and urban planner by profession and I've been working with SPARC, stands for Society for Promotion of Area Resource Center. It's an NGO in India that is a support NGO working with two community-based organizations um, and we are affiliated to the larger network of SDI, Slum Dwellers International. In the context of SPA, we know that um, Mukuru, like other larger settlements in the world, has a special case in itself and it requires a very different approach, which is a radical approach. And uh, it requires people like me and many other professionals like me who are trained uh, and are sensitive towards the issues of brownfield which may not be the same approach when we work with Greenfield. My role with the SPA is to provide, um, to bring in technical expertise um, from a planning perspective and, um, and to, to work as a part of the Housing, Commerce and Infrastructure Consortium um, to develop a special plan and the master plan with some other development control regulations that guide the SPA, which is actually the end outcome deliverable uh, at the end of these two years that the SPA will be giving to the county. The housing consortium is, um, is say, the center of all the other consortiums. Housing and infrastructure occupy maximum amount of land. After a very extensive phase of about three to four years of extensive data collection uh, that the Mungano team has done, we are now in a position where we are trying to collate the collected information and uh, make some sense of it in terms of spatial plan uh, and what it means with implications to land use, uh, what it means for infrastructure. And when you put the land use together, it, uh, it would tell you how much more land is required in order to provide more amenities. In a brownfield site, um, you already have limited space, you are not given a clean slate, so you are starting with a given fabric where 80% of the things are already determined, uh, it has been decided. Uh, and I, I know that as professionals we like to work with uh, clean slates because you get the choice of deciding what you want and what you think that you've been trained and taught to. In this context of SPEA, we have, we've been given 90% of what is already there and we are here to support and to make sure that uh, there is minimum level of hygiene, uh, it, it, the, the plan takes care of environmental uh, hazards and mitigation and so forth. Uh, as professionals, we always put the client first. So in this case, the community is the client, but at the same time, in a brownfield, they are also the designers. So you're, you're here only as a profession to articulate that, uh, to help them put it in pen and paper, but they are the ones who would tell you what is that they want, how is that they want it exactly, and you as a designer or planner is here to just hear those voices and do that. In India, we have uh, informal settlements where 90% of the structures are permanent or semi-permanent, what we call. We use a local way of saying it, uh, kachapaka. What I saw of Mukuru was that it was 99% temporary structures. They were shacks. They were built of all kinds of uh, temporary material you could think of. And I think that one element just changes the way uh, you deal with it, the way you look at it. It, it just changes everything. Um, be it planning or be it providing any infrastructure. Uh, it, it was a very different experience for me. SPA, you know, we, it stands for Special Planning Area. Calling it a Special Planning Area in itself is a very big acknowledgement to the world to say that we acknowledge that this is different from the rest of everyone else. And hence, we acknowledge that this requires a special attention it requires an absolute new thinking, it requires new techniques which I think even the best of people, professionals, are not trained and equipped with. We know Mukuru is 689 acres, but there are many more settlements uh, across the world which are the size and which are probably also bigger. They have not been declared as special, so I think that, that what 
makes Mukuru very special. At the same time, it's also a model um, which has never reached to an extent where the government is taking initiative. It's acknowledging, not only acknowledging, but also taking the courage to, to, to put it together to say that what can we do with this? Across the, the hierarchy within the government, from the county to the national government, uh, and, and there's a very strong political will, which we see is very absent in many other countries. I think it's a real big deal. Uh, it's, it's a big deal because it's not been done before and if, if we are succeeding and I am sure we will but if, if the process from end to end is able to deliver what it has started with then it's a real model to work um, with informality, to work on brownfield which is something that has not been done before. We know that the federations do savings, um, they do enumerations uh, they do data collection of themselves to, to be able to organize themselves, uh, to be able to negotiate, better negotiate what they need uh, from the governments. But what is special is that uh, there is a very nice relationship between the federations and the professionals and there is a, a feeding and a reverse feeding between the two. So never at a large scale like this um, that mobilization has happened that every single information that is being decided, li like the decisions say that are being taken uh, technically are uh, trickled down like that and then it feeds from bottom up. That process I think is very special that, uh, the, mo that the federations here are able to do. The scale at which we are working with 300,000 population and um, they, they have derived their own hierarchy of a cluster, village, uh, segment and then the area level. So that system is I think very special and I think that is the model that can be replicated. Now this model can be replicated in many ways. One is how you organize communities, how you as professionals um, unlearn what you've learned and start fresh to to work with brownfield because everything that you've learned in your planning does not always work here um, to question and challenge the norms and the guidelines and the policies that have been defined because they were defined for a different set of context for a different set of population um, to, to challenge those and to re redefine those at a policy level um, for governments across the world to look at this, look up at this and bring uh, change in the way the government looks at Brownfield. Um, and it also tells a lot about political will. I think without which uh, it, it would have been very, it, it would have been a big struggle to come so far. So, so for, for governance, from planning, uh, from communities, uh, from civil societies, it's actually a learning model for everyone else. Think that there were people who could just take some part of their time to, to do something like this and to just not do the normal, just not abide by all the, all what has been taught to you in your academic uh, profession, but, but, but to do something like that, to do, to work, you know, we need more of us, you know, because if you look at the total number of uh, informal settlements that are there in the world, I think there are going to be very soon going to be a big market of mukurus coming all over the world and uh, and how would the governments or anybody be able to work with communities if there weren't more people like us. Professionals who are willing to work with communities but also um, who are able to understand what the community needs and be able to articulate it to, to put it in a way to other professionals and governments uh, and to redefine what is a regular framework, what is a standard framework. Thank yeah. you.